Thank you very much. Uh, what a great pleasure it is to be here in Zoomer studios. I'm actually a Zoomer, so it's kind of fun to be here uh, with some boomers, I think, as well. So welcome. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about medical cannabis, edibles, topicals, and oils. Oh my, right? There's a lot of information there. Um, so much information so that actually, uh, as of today's date, there are over 360,000 people that have accessed medical cannabis in Canada. 360,000 have, uh, have applied for a medical document. So very exciting uh, times in terms of uh, research in this area. So I do uh, speak at uh, engagements in the industry and I'm compensated for that, but today uh, I'm also compensated for my talk. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the view from here. So I'm a student of cannabis. Uh, I learn from my patients and as well uh, as the, the sheer volume of uh, patients that I do see. My background is really actually in addiction and mental health. Um, I've kind of fallen into the track of uh, prescribing medical cannabis to my patients and I've done this for about just over six years. So uh, from addiction to mental health, the face of my uh, patients have changed primarily to uh, a 55 plus because people are seeking medical cannabis to help um, manage their pain. Uh, what I do believe uh, is that addiction is not a moral failure. I believe that uh, stigma is a barrier to care, for not only for people living with addiction, but also for people trying to seek care for medical cannabis. I'm, I'm wondering if a number of you here in an, an online audience may have had difficulty accessing cannabis through um, their physicians not really understanding or not knowing how to prescribe. Um, we always look at the risk versus benefit of all the medicines we prescribe and cannabis being one of those. And then always clinical research is hugely important in innovation and improving care for patients. And this is something that I'm very interested in. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the medical cannabis basics. And I understand that there was some talk uh, prior to about actually delving into endocannabinoid system. And I'll talk very briefly about that. Obviously questions of safety. I'm always grilled by my colleagues all the time. What the heck are you doing? There's no, not enough evidence. And I say, fight me. We have lots of evidence that supports what we do in our practice. Uh, we look at every case by case, um, and again, research and innovation and, and looking forward to, to future research. So this is a, a very um, brief diagram here on really the timeline of medical cannabis. This is not a new drug. Would you agree? This is not a new drug. This has been around for millennia. Uh, and quoting Dr. Zach Walsh, who is a, um, a psychologist out in uh, BC who works a lot with uh, substance use, PTSD, he calls this an ancient and gentle medication. So when we start to look at the history, we can look back to 1000 BC where there was a pharmacopoeia uh, on, on the list of different types of, different ways of using medical cannabis. Over a hundred written um, uh, recipes uh, for, for particular uh, ailments. We look at uh, a Chinese um, physician who operated on his pa uh, patients using a, a cannabis and wine. Now, we call that a Saturday night in Gimli, but um, no, we don't. Um, but it's, it's really, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very thankful for uh, research and uh, anesthesia in, in this 21st century. But we fast forward to 1964 where Dr. Rafi Mahulam, who is uh, still practicing as a bench scientist, he discovered that actually there was a molecule called THC. And then fast forward to the 90s where we discovered that we actually have receptors in our body for cannabis and we make our own endocannabinoids. So the basics, as I've alluded to, the endocannabinoid system is, is within us all. We are born with the system that helps us maintain balance. Balance as we modulate pain, mood, sleep, as well as our immune system. So when we look at the receptors in our body, CB1 receptors are for THC. Those are primarily in our nervous system. CB2 receptors are pretty much everywhere else, but heavily involved within our immune system. So I always say the dose is the poison. When legalization happened, how many people's hair started on fire? Oh my God, legal cannabis, what are we gonna do? People are gonna be running down the streets intoxicated. Well, that hasn't really happened actually. When we start to look at the stats, and I actually just pulled them up today, age groups that we were really concerned about, youth 
actually has gone down in numbers. The numbers have not changed to our 18 to 25 year. So, but who's using more cannabis? Us guys with gray hair, right? So when we talk about the THC, it is intoxicating, but again, the dose is the poison. Generally, most of my patients are using less than 20 milligrams a day in a 24 hour period, dependent on what, they're, what I see them for. In my patients that are trying to deprescribe from opiates, we have the ability to use cannabis as a substitution. It's not, it doesn't work 100% for everybody, but again, I always say my patients fall into a bell curve. The people in the middle generally are doing well. We deprescribe all kinds of medications over the counter, but the, it's the tails. It's the people that may be too sensitive to THC or the people that it doesn't really work very well. So those are the people that I'm very interested in. And then of course, CBD. So cannabidiol, which is the non-intoxicating form of cannabis. I don't say it's not psychoactive in the sense that it doesn't make you high. It does work in your brain, but it doesn't cause intoxication. And it activates um, many systems, especially our immune system. So what's the difference between medical and recreational consumers? So most of the medical patients that I see are generally cannabis naive, and we, we educate them. Um, they generally are consuming medicine, cannabis to help them reduce harmful medicines or medicines that they're really, um, that they're taking too much of, primarily around opiates and benzodiazepines. And uh, as Dr. Khan was alluding to, we worry about our elder population using benzodiazepines, and I've had a lot of success actually tapering people off. So most patients that are using medically are over the age of 50, the challenge with many patients, my oldest patient is 98 years old. Her 72-year-old friend brought her to my health center, rolled her in in her wheelchair, and uh, she was very excited to try this new medicine. The challenge is she doesn't have internet access. You cannot access medical cannabis at your local pharmacy, and most of my patients have a relationship with their pharmacist. Of course, there's limited access, and of course, that medicine is taxed. Recreationally, um, patients generally, when you, look, um, when you look at our rec market, so in Manitoba we have, I think, 30 recreational stores. I cannot tell you how many times I've had patients come in and they bring in their bottles that their grandkids have bought them and say, I don't know about this stuff, I, I need to learn about it. Um, seven out of 10 people that are showing up to recreational market in Manitoba are looking for medical. So we don't track them. Um, the average age is generally 19 plus. Patients or people can access it uh, easily, same day access. It's definitely taxed, but the challenge is for patients that are actually trying to access something same day, you're looking at a 50% markup. So always it's really about um, safety. So, and that's where I get uh, pushed a lot. Um, so I really look at the whole patient. What a novel approach, right? Um, we look at substances that are used in, the, in, in populations of people, and as Dr. Khan was talking, we worry about substance use, misuse in our elder population. But when we look at really, the, the, really look at the stats, alcohol is actually the biggest bad actor. Um, when we look at addiction rates, 76% of the population over the age of 18 is using alcohol, but 20% addiction rate. You look at opiates, well, we know we we're in an opiate crisis. We are losing people left, right, and center. One person every two hours in Canada dies of an opiate overdose. I don't want to take part in that in terms of overprescribing and prescribing appropriately. And then we look at cannabis. Cannabis, really, you're looking at a 9% risk for uh, addiction. But I always look at those patients that come to me that are overusing cannabis. They're medicating something. And with my addictions hat, um, it's generally trauma, pain. Pain comes in all kinds of packages. We can have bone pain, we can have arthritis pain, we can also have uh, emotional pain, existential pain. And then of course tobacco, we know that that's not good to use and obviously in patients that are smoking cannabis, some patients will actually, or some people will actually mix tobacco and cannabis and shouldn't do that. So driving, we always want to look at harms and benefits, obviously, of cannabis. Um, so in terms of inhalation, if you're going to inhale cannabis, we recommend vaporization. And I know there's 
people's, again, hair starts on fire when we talk about vaping, but I'll talk about that very quickly. Uh, obviously, patients that are, uh, have uh, underlying cardiac uh, history, we worry about uh, patients that are using high THC in that population. So uh, people that have arrhythmias, AFib, people that are on um, blood thinners, uh, that can sometimes work in the same pathway. Uh, as cannabis, uh, and as well, one of the, I always say I have nine pa nine patients in 6,500 patients that I've pr provided access to cannabis. Nine have had side effects. Seven, oh, it's diarrhea, is the is the main one. So two actually had underlying mental health issues and were overusing THC, and then of course dry mouth. Of course, we all know benefits for um, CBD primarily in terms of the anti-inflammatory. Um, uh, effects as well as an antispasmodic. And then we talked about substitution potential for opiates. Other considerations, we talk about vaping. Vaping is, uh, we talk about uh, vitamin E acetate that's been added to a lot of these liquid carts, uh, uh, cannabis vapes, and those have been done in the illicit market. That is not uh, in, in the illicit market. So in your legal market, uh, vaporization generally refers to those vape carts as well as dried flour in a uh, a little machine that you can uh, vaporize. We worry about the illicit market as well in terms of pesticides, cannabinoid contact. Uh, most uh, people that are in the illicit market are using only high THC. And then as well, education uh, for patients is really important because patients, um, a lot of patients are cannabis naive and they're they, they just don't have a hot clue as to how they should dose. And I've had a couple of patients come in and say, well, my granddaughter brought me these, these oils and I took too much of this and I ended up sleeping for 12 hours. <laughs> so you have to worry. You have to worry about that. So case by case, uh, what is the best way for cannabis, to use cannabis for me? <clears throat> so as I said, the patients may be uh, accessing the illicit market. Patients that have chronic non-cancer pain, primarily my arthritis patients, are using it as substitution. In Manitoba, they're accessing it through the uh, recreational markets, um, and it's mostly people over 50 that are, that are trying to access for uh, medical. Most patients are looking for high CBD, and they don't want to get high. There's a lot of uh, negotiation as to using THC in those populations, and a lot of people have misinformation. Uh, Dr. Google is not my friend. so. Uh, and obviously we worry about adverse events. So, so many variety of, of cannabis products out there, <clears throat> dry flower, oils, uh, soft gels, gel caps, vape pens, edibles, infused beverages. What do you know? How, how are you gonna take all this stuff? So it's really a, a very stepwise approach. <coughs> Pardon me. So for topicals, anybody recognize those chubby fingers there? Ouch, eh? So topicals um, work very nicely for patients. We know that we've got this skin and we've got three layers that we need to get through. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, so uh, we have to have a good understanding of what type of topical will actually permeate the skin. This is a, a model of inflammation. <coughs> Pardon me. So this is um, a, a very complex uh, diagram of inflammation and how our endocannabinoid system works to help reduce that inflammation. It works um, in a very complex manner. Uh, initially, that inflammation is acute, um, but as you go forward with that inflammation, if it's not arrested at that point, it develops into a chronic inflammatory process. Thank you. So we worry about um, people developing chronic uh, inflammatory issues, especially with skin rashes as it relates to people living with psoriatic arthritis, any of the uh, autoimmune arthritis, we, we don't want to get into a chronic situation. And I've had very good success with topicals for patients living with psoriasis. So allergies with topicals. So out in the market, in the legal market, there's various forms of topicals and they're just starting to come out in the market, but I have many patients that come in with some very nasty smelling tubs of stuff <laughs> that they've made themselves. And there could be an active component of cannabis. This is uh, a topical cannabis uh, that's not been cooked or activated and that is the rash. So it's always good to do a test site when you're using topicals. So as I said, 
the absorption rate. It does not cross the blood-brain barrier, so you're not going to get high if you apply a topical. Uh, using caution with open areas, especially if there's THC, um, it takes about 30 to 60 minutes for that to uh, take effect, and it can last anywhere from 4 to 12 hours. I have many patients that will use this uh, on joints, uh, on their back, and have had very good success. So these aren't your Kokums brownies, so your granny, okay? I don't know how many times I've had patients come in and talk about somebody made them an edible, and then they had a bad experience. I actually had one patient go to the hospital emergency department because he had taken an edible somebody had made, and he thought, oh, this isn't working, right? So he was like, 45 minutes, this is not working. So he takes another one, and then at about an hour, yeah, he was on that ride for about eight hours and didn't, couldn't get off, right? So you have to be very careful. We worry about that for the simple fact that it could drop your blood pressure. So this is why I worry uh, in, in populations of people that are living with uh, high blood pressure and they take their medication. This medicine can affect your blood pressure and I have patients that have actually come off their blood pressure medications because of cannabis. Right? So you have to be cautious. Um, if you are taking medications, you should talk to your doctor about uh, if, if cannabis is good for you. Um, but again, the formulations are endless. Oil-based generally is, is the go-to in terms of uh, uh, cannabis oils. They come in many formulations, high THC, THC and CBD, and, and primarily CBD. There's different ratios. There's uh, there are some strain-specific oils available, however, few and far between. There's a few companies that are doing that so far. Um, capsules are another option for patients that don't like to take oil. The oil can be very messy uh, and difficult to dose for patients that have uh, uh, arthritis in their hands. You're gonna start to see more in the recreational market. I know that uh, a number of the license holders are not kind of going down the candies chocolate uh, route. For patients that may not want to take a full dose, they could have a candy and use maybe half of it, wrap it up, put it away. Uh, chocolate again, um, can you only have one piece of chocolate? So you have to really watch the dosing. The dosing I think will be anywhere from one to 10 milligrams of THC, and there will be um, many formulations with CBD. If, if ever you're in a recreational situation and you're thinking about using cannabis, please use both together. Always have CBD with it because that quite often will help push the THC off the, the receptor so you're not getting as much of an effect. So again, with absorption and ingestion, as I kind of alluded to, please wait. Please wait. If you haven't had any effect after 90 minutes, then of course, by all means, go ahead and try another dose. But it can affect dosing, especially in patients living with uh, perhaps diabetes that may have a really slow gut or gastroparesis. Um, it can take somewhere to two to four hours. Um, my friends that uh, are on the uh, She Can Facebook website, they're, um, they're a group of women that are supporting each other. I think there's 4,000 of them out there. They always talk about having a small fatty snack. So cannabis likes fat. It works best in our bodies. Um, if patients are having difficulty and they're saying it's really not working, I always say have, a little, have something like a small fatty snack to help that absorb faster for you. So this is just an overview. This is a table that I give all my patients, and it's just an overview of what's of, how, how you can use cannabis. What I'm actually missing on this one, and we're not going to talk about that today, is suppositories. For our patients that are not able to take anything by mouth, that, that don't want to smoke, and especially for our patients living with um, GI problems, so ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, women living with endometriosis can use that as well. But really, this is just an overview of, of what I've just spoken about. And then dosing. So high CBD uh, is generally my rule of thumb. I, I generally go from 20 to 60 milligrams a day for patients to start them and then add in THC as needed. Uh, it is really dose dependent on affordability. And for all of you that are on, uh, whoever is on medical cannabis, uh, we have to really look at the price point for patients. A lot of patients say, oh my gosh, I wish I could take more, but they can't afford it. Um, cannabis naive patients on opi opioids, I can speak to uh, a particular case, uh, two gentlemen that I'm caring for now, 
Um, one is on, uh, both are on high dose opiates. This gentleman was on, I think 120 uh, equivalents of morphine. And in six weeks, he's come off all of that using medical cannabis. And so high CBD, 200 milligrams a day, plus about 40 milligrams of THC. And I think within the next, so he's still having withdrawal from that, but he said he, he can't believe it because he actually doesn't have pain. He's just really going through withdrawal. So he's done really well, and he has degenerative disc disease and arthritis in his back. So again, looking at anxiety versus depression, um, I have a lot of patients that will come in and say, oh my gosh, I'm so anxious and I'm smoking so much cannabis. Uh, they're taking way too much THC. THC can actually be, it's counterintuitive. Too much THC can actually make your anxiety worse. So I generally will encourage those patients to use high CBD and low, low percentage uh, THC. As well, in depression, patients will have a little bit more THC for activation. And always with anybody that it, you're considering cannabis or trying it even recreationally, please go low and slow. If, if you take away anything from today, uh, low, low, low. And uh, increase your dose every one to three days. So research and innovation. So this is kind of uh, where I'm very excited. And I'm uh, so impressed with the Arthritis Society and, and the support they've given to research and innovation. We have evidence on the horizon. So we know uh, the sh there's shortage of uh, research um, as well because of restrictions through Health Canada. I think to date there's 200 research licenses out there. Um, I would love to be able to do research in my practice um, but I can't because we can't dispense cannabis on our site, so you have to get a special uh, dispensation to do that. There's thousands of papers out there that really support uh, cannabis as an antispasmodic, as an anti-inflammatory, um, and an analgesic. We start to look at anti-cancer and sedative effects as well, uh, which again is very exciting. Patients' perspectives are key. So when I say I'm a student, I learn every day from my patients that come to see me um, about using medical cannabis. We learn together and uh, patients become allies in our research. So we know that 63%, this is a paper from 2014, uh, uh, over 290 patients were, um, uh, they had a questionnaire done, and 63% uh, were uh, using cannabis to substitute for prescription drug 30% for opiates, 16% for benzodiazepines, 25% for alcohol and tobacco uh, at 12%, which is fascinating because in my practice, we see patients uh, stop. Uh, especially with high, high CBD, um, patients actually will lose the craving for alcohol and other substances, which is fascinating and very um, um, uh, interesting, especially for patients that are living with crystal meth and uh, cocaine addiction. This lady is a very cool lady. I don't know if you've anybody read the New York Times. This was uh, just this about six months ago. One of the researchers associated with this uh, study is actually from Calgary. This lady is a very happy lady. She has a genetic deletion that deletes her breaks for making her own THC. Pretty cool, eh? So she's really happy. They call her blissed out. Um, but interestingly, she's covered in scars. She's 71 years old. She's probably 72 now. She lives in Scotland. Covered in scars. She, she feels no pain. So she had a baby. She said it felt like it was tickling her. She broke her wrist. She had surgery. Didn't require any medication postoperatively. In, in her family, there are people that have similar genetic deletions, but not to the extent that she has. So when you start thinking about that as development, and this is within her endocannabinoid system that she has that deletion. So we start thinking about that. Hmm, could we create a medicine that will not be harmful, that will not cause us to have addiction? And could we do that? So she's a very exciting uh, person and she's very happy. So this is great. The other thing when we talk about topicals, and again, this is not really arthritis based, but Cannabis compound could be a weapon to fight against superbugs. We worry about antibiotic, we, antibiotics and overuse, and antibiotic stewardship is something that we as physicians have undertaken. After we've written tons of prescriptions for it, now we have to kind of hold back. So this was actually in a mouse model uh, where they applied topical cannabidiol and MRSA, so methicillin-resistant staph aureus, gone. 
uh, we have two patients in our practice right now um, that have had topical cannabidiol, and especially in a lady that had a below knee amputation and had a wound that would not heal, completely healed applying cannabidiol. Uh, and then in another gentleman that had um, uh, peripheral vascular disease, so he had lots of swelling in his feet and uh, subsequent callus, um, his legs are clearing up as well. So topical cannabidiol is, is something that we're very interested in. And so going forward, patients and physicians are learning together. This is so important, um, and so we appreciate, I appreciate when patients can be honest and forthright and tell me what they're doing uh, to manage their pain. Um, as uh, Dr. Kahn was talking about substance use in elder population, it's really quite interesting when we do a drug screen in those populations about what people are actually using. So um, I'm, I'm in a very privileged place when we talk about addiction and mental health because people tell me things. And now with this, I actually have something that can help them. I have another tool in my belt. It's not the panacea, it's not the, the unicorn. It is another tool that we must um, do more research with. So today, what I'd like you to think about is really about um, if you're using cannabis and how, how you would like to um, take that. Uh, obviously, ingestion is the best when you're looking at more than one affected joint, particularly with arthritis. Topical may be the best for a localized area. Again, start low and go slow. We don't want you to run into trouble or running down the street without any clothes on. We don't want that to happen either. Um, and the, the biggest issue really is accessibility and affordability. Accessibility and affordability, I cannot stress enough. So in terms of um, lobbying Health Canada to provide uh, safe access for patients to um, have relationships with their pharmacy, to have medication reviews with their pharmacist as it relates to using cannabis, as well uh, insurance companies to be able to cover it. Um, Document your successes and your challenges when you're using cannabis. I want to hear about it. Your physician will want to hear about it. It's important um, because we're all doing research. We're all students uh, as, it, as it relates to medical cannabis, and we're learning um, uh, so much about this amazing plant. And that is it. Okay, we have some online questions, and I think you've actually touched on some of the things that, that people want to know sure. more about. So, the first question. Can CBD cause liver problems? Is it safe to take with methotrexate? Hmm. Okay. Um, so, you have to really look at the pathway. So, we talk about um, pathways that go through our liver. We have many of them. Um, methotrexate generally has been safe, but we always want to follow that patient, obviously, closely. Uh, we talk about, there's been just a paper released on the possibility that CBD may cause liver toxicity. Uh, it really, some people will have elevated liver enzymes, but the people that I've seen, I haven't seen that happen. So it may be something that is a one-off, but it's not something that I've seen in my practice. Okay, here's something you did touch on. Cannabis is so expensive. Are there more affordable ways to access medical cannabis? Well, I don't want you to go to jail, so <laughs> that would be stealing it. So, no. Um, <laughs> No, I, I think um, it, it's so challenging for many patients. Um, there is the ability to grow cannabis under the medical regimen, but that I always kind of say, you know, there's um, challenges with that in itself because patients aren't able to test their cannabis. For me as a physician, I really want to know what they're taking. Um, the license holders will have certificate of analysis. Um, and so we look at that certificate and we can say, is this working for you? We can look at the terpene profile, the cannabinoid profile. Whereas in, in the growing market, we don't, we don't see that. So until our insurance companies get on board, until we decide that we're not gonna tax this medicine, we're kind of stuck with what we have. Uh, and again, something you touched on, how do I know what dose to start at? Right. So uh, I always say to my patients, we start everybody on the same. I generally do, will do a group education with four patients, and I'll say, okay, 
everybody's today's going to start off in the same. I start generally at 10 milligrams uh, morning and afternoon of CBD. And then if patients are having trouble sleeping, I'll use a combination of THC and CBD. Formulations in a one full syringe can be anywhere from 10 milligrams of THC and 15 of CBD. Uh, I start them off on 0 0.1 ml. So it really is about one to, to two milligrams, one milligram of THC. So everybody starts off on the same. When I see them back at their next appointment, everybody will be on something different. So start low, go slow. Okay, is it safe to take cannabis with my arthritis medication? Well, it depends on what arthritis medication you're taking. Yeah. So patients that are taking arthritis medications, and those are generally DMARDs, so disease-modifying agents, biologics, I generally, uh, or, and over-the-counter, so how many patients with arthritis take way more ibuprofen than they should? Tylenol than they should, right? So people are taking mitfuls. So what's worse? So when I start prescribing that cannabis to those patients, generally the first thing to go is over the counter. Um, and then I let them have that conversation with their rheumatologist about medicines. We don't want any damage to happen to people's joints, but we just don't have enough evidence to say, no problem, stop. So um, we, we get them to continue. Okay, and another question about an interaction with CBD and uh, what about blood thinners? So we worry about this, that pathway, and so patients may be on blood thinners that we monitor on a regular basis, like warfarin. So it would be just like taking another medication. It, it does follow that similar pathway, and I believe it's 3A4 and to 3A6 pathway, cytochrome P450. Um, we have to really watch the blood counts for those patients on warfarin. For the patients that are taking the non-monitored, again, we monitor them and we, we tell them uh, there is a possibility that this may be competing and uh, um, it's really about being, being watchful. Okay, can medical cannabis help increase a person's appetite and lead to weight gain? <laughs> So Munchies. Yeah, yeah, for sure, I guess. And that's really about how you're using it. And so, yes, there are some patients that may gain weight, but actually what I see is the opposite. And specific uh, um, really? THC strains, so THCV is something that we look at uh, uh, as a potentially novel uh, drug to help people lose weight. Uh, and we're looking at, at that in our, our patients living with diabetes. Patients living with diabetes, generally, I have uh, a number of patients, and I'm thinking about one man in particular. Uh, he reduced, he kept having lows. And we were like, what the heck is going on? This is when I first started. Um, and actually, he was able to reduce his insulin requirements by 50% because of this THCV, uh, as well as the cannabidiol. So there's definitely potential in our patients living with diabetes to help drive that sugar back in the cell. So one of the things that I always tell my patients, if you have diabetes, I want you to make sure that you're monitoring your sugars, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, um, and to ensure that uh, you're not having lows because we may have to adjust your medication. Okay, uh, we may need an accountant for this one. Uh, can I claim medical cannabis on my taxes like other medications? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Okay. So um, I always tell patients, uh, so if they've been accessing the rec store and they're going, well, it's just easier to do that. And I say, well, you can't write off a case of beer. You're not going to write off your cannabis. So if you're truly using this medically, come into the medical program and then we adjust, we adjust them and then they can actually put that towards their taxes. Oh, and here's a good one. Can I travel to the U.S. with medical cannabis? Not if unless not, you want to go to jail. Will I have jail? to stop my treatment? <laughs> not unless you want to go to jail. Um, so it's really challenging, and actually, um, I, I'd really love for our snowbird associations to to really lobby the government for this. There's a number of legal uh, markets in the in the states, and I have patients that have actually changed their. Uh, destination to actually go to a place where it's legal. So there are ways that we can, there's synthetic cannabis. Yeah, but it's, cannabis. Illegal, it's illegal federally there. Federally, but in the state, they can use it. I know, it. but traveling with you it? You cannot. No, no, no. No, you cannot. But patients have changed their destination so that they can actually buy, buy cannabis it there. there. Um, and there are synthetic forms of cannabis, uh, which can be very challenging for patients because they, uh, it's very strong. So they sometimes will use that dependent, but for the most part, they, they're kind of stuck. What if my doctor won't talk to me about cannabis? Mm -hmm. You can ask them for a referral. Uh, and if not, come and see me.
<laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, you have to find a prescribing doctor. Uh, it's challenging because physicians, all physicians across Canada are allowed to write a medical document for cannabis. If they tell you that it's not allowed, it's just because they're not comfortable to do that. So it, it would be the patient, if the physician is not willing to, to prescribe or refer, then it's going to be the patient seeking help themselves. Yeah, at a lot of uh, the licensed uh, producers or the uh, medical cannabis, they, they have doctors on call. Yeah, they do, for sure. Okay. Uh, what if CBD and THC have little effect on me? That's an excellent question. I was just talking about, you know, the, the uh, bell curve. So I'm very interested in the people that are very sensitive and the people that you could give them a whole bottle of it and it doesn't work. So when I talk about uh, um, new research, we're talking about really precision medicine, pharmacogenomics, the genetic expression of your endocannabinoid system and all the variants, because you guys are all stars in the sky. Some of you might belong to constellations. Um, so... Um, it's, it's, the research is coming, and so we're going to get to the point where we're precisely able to uh, prescribe specifically for you. So, okay, research. Okay, we can now open it up to our studio audience. Anyone? I've answered all the questions. Just hold on, hold on. And, and what's your name, please? My name's Brenda. I'm uh, wondering, for example, like, I'm assuming you shouldn't drive if you're taking this stuff. And I'm assuming, what if you're looking after grandchildren? Uh, like I'm talking about taking it for a medical reason. Mm -hmm. Like, are you going to be okay with doing that and looking after grandchildren? Well, Brenda, it depends on what you're taking, right? So if you're using high CBD, no intoxication. Right. If you're adding, so I have patients that will take 60 milligrams of CBD and add in maybe two milligrams of well, THC. That's what I heard you say, adding in that Right, bit with and that so effect. that is, the CBD is really buffering the um, intoxicating effects of the THC. Mm -hmm. You still get getting the opiate sparing ability from the THC, but no intoxication. So You'd be can, okay. can you drive? if you're not intoxicated. The rule of thumb is, uh, and again, the low risk use guidelines are available as well, but if you feel intoxicated, don't drive. If you're, if you're taking uh, THC and CBD at night for sleep, generally you should feel fine in the morning unless you've taken too much and then you need to check yourself. Patients say at night, so when you're sleeping, does it have the effect in the daytime of no pain or you have to be taking it to have the no pain? So mostly patients are taking CBD during the day. Okay. Most of my patients are retired, so they're not having to worry about THC during the day. But most that use THC, THC during the day are taking such small amounts with such a good CBD buffer that they, they're fine. Okay, great, thank you. Anyone else? Okay, thank you so much. Thank you very much. <laughs>